Hey everybody, this is a late night dispatch from Sociology 206. <laughs> I do these late at night because it's nice and quiet. Um, this is the first of two lectures on prisons. Uh, and we're going to discuss something called the, the school to prison pipeline in this one. But we, we, this is a huge topic. This is a huge topic. And one reason it's a huge topic is that the United States incarcer incarcerates a higher percentage of its population than any nation on earth. Uh, more than the Soviet Union did during communism, more than South Africa did during apartheid. We don't really know much about China, um, so China might have a speed on that one, but uh, we have a really high incarceration rate. We love to lock people up, and we don't talk much about what happens to them while they're in prison. We really don't want to happen, talk much about what happens to them when they're released. Um, and so on this particular uh, lecture, I'm going to give you kind of an overview of prison and some of the issues that come up. And uh, um, I taught a prison course, a course on prison culture at University of Oregon and Portland State University. So I'm actually going to use some of my slides on this particular presentation just to give us kind of a picture of the overall picture, a picture of the picture of prisons um, and the high rate uh, that we have. So we're going to kind of just dive into this issue and give you kind of a snapshot of incarceration in America. Uh, when we look, so first of all, let's get our terminology straight, because a, a lot of times the words jail and prison get thrown around interchangeably. And so we want to um, kind of know what those terms mean. Prisons are long-term uh, correctional facilities where you're going to be staying for a year or more and are typically run by the state state of Oregon, Department of Corrections, for example, or the federal government, the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Jail is local, is city or county, like the Multnomah County Jail, where a lot of the protests have been in front of the Justice Center, uh, and they are where you will be warehoused for uh, a year or less. So sometimes people are held in jail while they're awaiting trial, if they're given a short uh, sentence, you know, 60 days in lockup, six months in lockup, it's in jail. Um, and so jail is sort of used to help give some flexibility to the prison system. But usually when we talk about people who are locked up for a long period of time, it's in prison. So those terms get thrown around a lot. When we look at the most recent data, the 2020 data, over uh, how many people are in, how many Americans are in jail or prisons, uh, that's um, two, two million uh, over 2 million, 2.1 million, which is r roughly 1% of the American population. One in 100 people is locked up in a jail or a prison. That is an incredibly high incarceration rate. But that's not the whole picture. Uh, we also have juveniles in custody. That's about 44,000 kids in lockup, places like um, the Multnomah County lockup, which is called Donald E. Long Juvenile Correctional Facility. Uh, we have immigration detention, about 42,000. So almost as many immigrants are in detention, um, especially in places like Texas and California, but also in Oregon. We have a nice detention center in Portland, uh, as are juveniles in custody. But then there's this larger category that a lot of people kind of forget about, which is probation and parole. Uh, probation are people who are found guilty of a crime either in a court of law or in some sentencing agreement, uh, but are deemed not a great enough threat to be locked up in prison. But they are still in custody of the state, so they're put on probation. And probation doesn't mean just, you know, be good and don't get in trouble again. Probation is you're being supervised. You have strict limitations. You might not be able to leave the state. You might have to go to school or have a job or not associate with known gang members or... Uh, have a, uh, a weekly or monthly urine test to make sure you're not using drugs. Uh, and so it's a pretty heavy deal. And the ideal is in probation is if you screw up, then you go to prison. You know, if you come in with a dirty urinalysis, um, you know, your probation will be revoked and you're going to go to prison. Um, parole is similar, and these often get kind of thrown together. Parole are people who are coming out of prison. They've served their time in prison, but they're not free. They're released on parole, but it doesn't mean that you are now free of the system. You're still under supervision. You're sort of like on probation, and you have to follow the certain guidelines, including re regularly reporting with your parole officer, doing your analysis test, uh, 
uh, staying in the state, not associating with known gang members and things like that. So there's a huge number of people who are on probation and parole. And this is real. I mean, if you're looking for careers in the criminal justice system, have sort of a social work angle, probation, probation and parole is a really good one because there's such a need for people to be caseworkers of these people who are still in the system but not in prison. So when we look at parole and probation, uh, folks, that's 4.5 million people. 4.5 million people. So they're not in prison, but they're still in some type of control setting, including uh, living at home. And then there are others, including military jails and jails on reservations and people who are under house arrest. And when we total all those people up, jail, prison, probation, parole, juveniles in custody, immigrants, uh, we get 6.77 million people. That's 2% of the U.S. population. 2%. So two of every hundred Americans, that 2%, that includes babies, by the way, people that are in a coma, the coronavirus, like that is a straight up percentage. 2% of the American population is in some type of criminal justice setting, either a probation, parole, prison, jail, detention center. Um, and we spent a massive amount and it fluctuates wi widely uh, depending on the size of the state, but roughly you know, including huge states like California and small states like Rhode Island, averages out to about $60 billion a state. So we spent an incredible amount of money, roughly about $35,000 a year per inmate. Uh, as those inmates get both older and younger, uh, it's more expensive. So, for example, for juveniles, it's about $80,000 a year to lock these people up. This is money that we pay for to lock up 2% uh, of Americans. Uh, we spend money out of our pockets for that. See, maybe there's an alternative. And what might be behind that? So we're going to kind of talk about that issue uh, today. Uh, also, when we look at one of the themes, you know, that we've been talking about in this class is um, institutional racism. This is one of the areas where we get real examples of institutional racism. So we were talking, you know, about the criminal justice system and things like racial profiling and racism and policing. And we really see it when, when people get sent to prison. Uh, according to 2008 data from the Bureau of Justice Statistics, uh, African American males, and look, just looking at the male population in prison, are 34% of the people locked up in prison. Not jails, but just in prisons. 34%. African Americans are only 13% of the population, or 34% of the arrests, of the uh, uh, incarcerations. Uh, Latino males are 24% of those locked up. Uh, Latinos make up about 18% of the population, and white males in the white in the male population of inmates are only 29% of the population. Ma white people are about 76, 77% of the population in America, 76% of the population, but only 29% of those locked up. So you see a real disproportionate presence of black and brown bodies in prison, and you'll notice this if you ever walk into a prison. I mean, one of the reasons I do this work is I spend a lot of time in my research field in prisons and even in Oregon you notice as soon as you walk into a prison that is disproportionately black and brown. A study was done in 2001 and found that one in six black men were behind bars in America either in a jail or a prison and that reflects some of the institutional biases that we've been talking about all quarter. So I'm going to give you a brief history of prisons kind of what the idea behind this was and it really uh, was a product of the Enlightenment, kind of like sociology itself. Before the Enlightenment, in the period we call the Dark Ages, um, there were no prisons. Uh, the criminal justice system was very capricious and random. You could, you know, steal a loaf of bread and be thrown in jail, or steal a loaf of bread and be burned at the stake, or steal a loaf of bread and pay a fine. It was really no system, uh, and there was a lot of torture in those days. Uh, because it was believed that God loved you when you did good things, but the devil was there to make you do bad things. And so if the devil was making you commit crimes, the way to get the devil out of you was to torture you. And so if you know about Edgar Allan Poe, there was just all kinds of incredibly inhumane torturing, the pit and the pendulum and hot tar and feathering. And one of the torture devices was called the Judas Cradle, where they would just lower you down naked onto this pointed chair that would impale you up your rear end because of Jesus. Uh, and so there was a 
revolution of thinking that happened with the Enlightenment. So the Enlightenment, some of you might remember if you've taken my 204 class, the impact on the Enlightenment and rational thinking. But the idea of science, that science is based on rational thought and empiricism. So the classic uh, example of, of the Enlightenment is, excuse me, Gal Galileo. Galileo. Uh, you know, the rational idea that the Earth is going around the sun and not vice versa, and they did a little empirical research. And so there was an explosion of sciences starting in the 1700s uh, that we called the Enlightenment. And one of these uh, Enlightenment thinkers was a Italian reformer named Cesar Baccaria. And Baccaria was an Enlightenment thinker. He wrote the, the, this famous piece in 1764 called On Crime and Punishment. Uh, that said, we should have a rational system. Let's have a rational system of punishment. Um, instead of being random, we should have a punishment that's slightly greater than the cost of the crime. So if you've ever heard the phrase, let the punishment fit the crime, it comes from Bakaria uh, in 1764. So the idea is if you steal a loaf of bread, and that loaf of bread is 10 cents, you know, you get a fine of 50 cents for stealing a loaf of bread. And then if you get caught, you could have bought five loaves of bread for what, you know, for, for the stealing the one loaf. So it's rational not to steal it. Uh, and his belief was that um, if you let the punishment fit the crime, you have penalties, um, the crime will disappear because people are rational beings. And there was a certain amount of logic to this. I mean, there's a reason we, despite the fact that some people think they should, you don't give the death penalty for rape, right? You don't give the death penalty for rape because if a rapist knows that he is going to get the death penalty for raping a woman. It's in his interest to kill her, his victim, so he doesn't get caught because he's going to get the death penalty either way. So you have to have a rational system of punishment. So out of this became the idea of the modern prison. Let's have a place to warehouse people who do bad things. Instead of burning them at the stake or dumping hot lead on them or all these sort of medieval tortures, let's create a system of separate confinement and we'll say hey you do this offense and you are going to get 60 days in jail or two years in prison or life in prison um, that we're going to have a system and of course his idea was that would be a deterrent because people are rational beings and they don't want to go to prison so they won't just won't commit crimes the problem is and i think you know what the problem is People are not rational. People are not rational for a whole bunch of reasons. They're not rational because they're drunk. They're not rational because they have a mental illness. They're not rational because they just found their wife in bed with another man and they're going crazy. They're not rational because they're teenagers and their brains don't work. I mean, there are all kinds of reasons that we're not rational. Sometimes we're just not rational. Sometimes we're just not rational. Most of the time, I'm not rational. But it spurred this birth of the modern prison. In the United States, the first prison emerged shortly after this in Philadelphia. It was called the Walnut Street Prison. Uh, and the idea of it was you pay penance. That's the idea of penitentiary is you are silent and you stay in uh, a space by yourself and you reflect on the bad things that you did. And when you come out, you'll be all better. Um, hello. There was a um, reform movement that began in the early 20th century around prisons that was the birth of the notion of the reformatory, that the goal of a prison isn't just to punish people, it's to reform them, to make them better people. And there was sort of a medical model that was working at the time, the idea that um, crime is a sickness, it's a social sickness, it's a social ill, and so like other sicknesses, we can cure it. And so if you can put people in a setting and reward them for good behavior, uh, when it's time to come out, they'll be good people. And so there was this movement to create a more humane model at the beginning of the 20th century. But in reality, when you looked at these prisons, for the most part, they were warehouses for poor people and immigrants. They were people who were des de deemed undesirable by the white middle class. Uh, and seen as somehow problems and out of sight, out of mind. Let's just send these poor immigrants to the prison. And so the ref even though there was this notion of reformatory, it was really rooted in a kind of racism. So there emerged a kind of competing ideology about what prisons were all about. And so there are sort of these three ideologies that emerge in, in prisons. Uh, one is the deterrence model, and this, is the, this goes back to the Enlightenment. The deterrence model is the idea that prisons should have a degree of terror. 
that you should hear bad things about prisons. You should hear that they aren't friendly places and people are violent and savage and you're going to hate every second of it. Uh, and that will deter you from doing bad things because nobody wants to go to a place where they're going to be tortured. There was a very famous documentary that came out in the late 1970s called Scared Straight. It won the Oscar for the best documentary and it used this model. It took a bunch of hooligan juvenile delinquents who are just sassy and, and obnoxious and think that they're, you know, they can do whatever they want. And you spend a day dragging them into an adult prison where you have a bu bunch of lifers, a bunch of, you know, lifetime convicts. Uh, and you lock these juveniles in a room with these lifetime convicts and the convicts scare the shit out of them. They talk about how they're going to rape them, how about they're going to, you know, raffle off their bodies, how they're going to use and abuse these kids. And of course, it's very satisfying because these kids, you know, who think they're all that, all of a sudden are like trembling and shaking and crying and mother mommy and they come out um, and, um, you know, swear to God that they're never going to break another law. Uh, the reality, when you follow those kids historically, a whole bunch of them reoffend and has absolutely zero effect on them. That whole deterrent model is good for TV and movies, but it has no real effect because, again, people are not rational. And sometimes people are in situations where they have to do irrational things. You know, they've got people coercing them to sell drugs or forcing them to be violent or they have no other choice. And so, yeah, prison is scary, but maybe I won't get caught and maybe I won't go to that scary place that I visited when I was a 16-year-old delinquent. So the deterrence model uh, looks good on paper, but it doesn't really doesn't really have much of an impact. In fact, we know that states with the death penalty actually have higher murder rates. They call it the brutalization effect. In fact, there's usually a spike in murders when they execute somebody in a place like Florida because violence is the norm. So that idea of prison scaring, it's supposed to be scary to stop you. It may have an impact. It certainly, you know, as someone who's spent a lot of time doing research in prison, I don't want to go to prison, so I'm going to do everything I can not to go to prison. Uh, but, um, but in general, it doesn't have a deterrent effect. Uh, the second model is what we call the retribution model. And the retribution model wants to look at, or uh, wants to look at sort of uh, punishment. It's purely punishment. It doesn't matter if people are rehabilitated. It doesn't matter if they're deterred. You did something bad, you're going to get punished. Just like your parents would punish you when you did something bad. It's purely punitive because, you know, as the philosopher Kant argued, we have a moral obligation to punish people who break the rules of society. And so it should be painful because people did painful things. If you murdered somebody, you shouldn't get it easy. You should have a life of punishment. Uh, if you stole a car, you shouldn't be rewarded for it. You should be punished for it. And so the idea of the, of the, of the retribution model is the sort of punitive notion that we are morally obligated to punish people who break the rules. The third model is the rehabilitation model. The re rehabilitation model focuses on the rights of the people who are locked up. They are individuals with rights, including due process rights and the rights to their religion and the right to free speech and Right, right to bear arms is one that is not allowed in prison. The courts have deemed it's your Second Amendment rights. Second Amendment rights go right out the window as soon as you get locked up. Do I have a right to have a gun? No, you don't. Uh, but looks at uh, prison as a place where there can be treatment because the idea is, and this is an important point. This is going to be the focus of the second uh, video that we do on prisons. Is um, ninety-five percent of the people who go to prison walk out of the gate. 95. The other 5% die in prison. They're either executed or they're murdered or they have a heart attack and die or die of cancer or loneliness or whatever. Suicide. That's a big one. 95% uh, come back into the community. What are those people going to be like? Uh, I was doing work at a juvenile correctional facility and I saw a bumper sticker that literally changed the whole focus of my scholarship, of my research. And all it said was, today's prisoner is tomorrow's neighbor. Right? There's a lot of people... I mean, if we're going to lock up 2% of our population, there's a lot of people who have done time, maybe in this class. I mean, I always argue in any college setting, there are sort of two populations that are sort of un, unnoticed or kind of invisible. One are veterans, people, especially people who come back from war, they're not wearing their uniform in the classroom, so we don't know who's a vet and who's not. And the other are former inmates, formerly incarcerated people. Uh, there's a lot of people at PCC and other universities, including, you, you know, your favorite private schools, 
uh, who have done time. You know, such a, a huge amount of the population has done time. So what type of people do we want coming out moving next door? Do we want people who are completely tweaked and traumatized? I mean, you want to talk about PTSD. Right? There are people, and again, we're going to get into this, who are severely traumatized by their incarceration experience, and now um, they're living next door to us. So the rehabilitation model looks for treatment, ways of treating those people so they can walk out of the gate. Those 95% of the popu prison population that leave uh, can be you know, reintegrated in society. The, the problem here is that something started to happen in the 1980s, and that was an explosion in the prison population. Between 1980 and the year 2000, the prison population quadrupled. We saw a huge explosion. And this is uh, something that was quite shocking to criminologists and people who watch it to see the prison population just balloon. Um, and it was really tied to a kind of shift in philosophy away from retribution, excuse me, away from rehabilitation and more towards retribution. This is what we call the getting tough on crime period. Uh, and this coincides with the war on crime and the war on drugs. And so it's important for us to kind of talk about that because we're dealing with that prison explosion now and what's behind the prison explosion. Um, so why was there this explosion in the prison population. Well, part of it was a frustration with rehabilitation. There was this notion that nothing works. We rehabilitate these people, they come out of prison, and they go right back to crime. In fact, we were seeing a rise of the crime rate in the 1970s, and they thought, well, wait a second, we're supposed to be re rehabilitating all these people, and they're coming out of prisons and going right back to their gangs or their domestic violence or, you know, the types of crime they were involved in before they got arrested. So there was this real frustration with rehabilitation. And of course, we hadn't really tried all the important things uh, that research tells us we should do to rehabilitate people. But that's a story for another day. So the, number one was a, a response to nothing works. Um, number two was the shift in uh, federal policy. This is the era of Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan had a real focus on urban crime. He saw urban crime as a black thing, and we, he used it very successfully to get elected in 1980. So there was a huge crackdown uh, on people in the city committing crime. But there also was something that happened in the 1980s under Ronald Reagan, which is cities were defunded. There was a, a, a notion under this idea of Reaganomics that the federal government shouldn't be funding all these war and poverty programs that were start, started by Johnson in the 60s. And so a lot of job training programs, a lot of after school programs, a lot of community centers, a lot of things that had federal funding in urban America all of a sudden lost their funding. I remember in Atlanta, uh, the, the Martin Luther King pool, which is right around the corner from where Martin Luther King's tomb is and where they had the funeral for, for John Lewis. Uh, we used to swim there in the summer. If you were could uh, be a lifeguard, you could swim for free there. And it was a neighborhood pool in an African-American neighborhood, lower income neighborhood. And one day we show up in 1984 and the, the door was locked. Big paddle, I'll never forget a big paddle lock on the door uh, and a sign saying we've lost our federal fund, funds. So where did those kids go, those, those kids who in the summertime were um, swimming at the pool, right? They, there was no jobs. The, all the jobs were leaving. There was no after-school programs. There was no job training. There was nothing. And so the gangs filled that void. Uh, also filling that void was crack, which played a big role in urban America. Cocaine was a very popular drug among white people. I'm not going to sing Eric Clapton. If you want to get down, down on the ground, cocaine. Uh, cocaine was very popular with rich white people in the 1970s. So in a, a way that came along to make it available for poor urban people, of course they want to have what rich white people have, which is cocaine, and that was crack. And that created a huge um, market that filled that void that was created by Reaganomics. And so there was this new war on drugs because of the crack epidemic that focused a lot of law enforcement on um, urban America, and that meant black people. That a lot of black and brown people all of a sudden were being thrown in prison. And so very quickly, uh, the prison population ballooned because of this, let's get tough on crime, nothing works, uh, we're not going to spend any money on the cities. Oh, crime is going up in the cities, and all of that crime is fueled by the crack trade. Let's take all those people and throw them in prison. And so voila, voila. You get the um, kind of explosion. Um, 
and I think that's worth um, talking about. So when we try to talk about what explains the prison, prison boom, um, the first thing that always comes up is uh, the war on drugs. The war on drugs increased um, the prison population by a thousand percent under President Reagan. A thousand percent, right? Ten times a hundred percent. A thousand percent of uh, people going to prison, including, you know, this is mostly for nonviolent drug charges, including possession. You know, zero tolerance laws said if you've got a joint on you, you're going to prison. You know, I told that story about New York, the John Lennon thing. You know, at New York under Giuliani, if you had one joint, you could go to prison. You definitely were going to jail. And so there were, um, uh, so there was an increase of people who were in prison on nonviolent drug charges. It's an important thing to point out. We don't want to send, we want to send murderers and rapists to prison. But all of a sudden, uh, there was a thousand percent increase in the number of people who were going for nonviolent drug charges, including possession, not just selling and trafficking, but possession. So the war on drugs is the number one explainer of that boom. Um, we, we also saw the laws change, uh, especially the drug laws under something called the Lynn Bias Law that was signed by President Reagan and discussed in the movie that you watched. Uh, it increased the probability of incarceration. You know, it used to be if, your first, if it was your first offense, you would get probation. Don't do it again. You're going to be under control of the state. Uh, but we don't want to warehouse you in prison. You're going straight to prison now. Under the new draconian drug laws under Reagan, uh, you were going straight to prison, especially if you had crack. As you saw, crack, you know, was you 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 had to have a hundred times the amount of co powder cocaine that you had of cr crack to go to prison, and so it was a way of targeting Black America. We also know the prison sentences got longer. There were these. Um, Sentencing Reform Act signed in 1984 uh, by President Reagan that meant, uh, you know, if you get a 20-year sentence in prison, you're not going to get out in five years for good behavior. You're serving 20 years in prison. And so the prison sentences got longer. There was also a reduction of the rehabilitation services, including community-based sanctions. So all that got shut down. And we also saw an increase in incarceration of women, especially around drugs. Again, these people would be put on probation. These women are now being sent to prison. So if you've seen Orange is the New Black, <laughs> but a fairly good uh, portrayal of women in prison. You know a lot of them are there on drug-related charges. Uh, there's a few other factors uh, that explain this uh, phenomenon. One is uh, the, the larger prison industrial complex, the fact that people are making money off of um, locking people up. There are private prisons that enter uh, the fray um, that make actually make money based on how many people they have incarcerated. Uh, there are people who supply the food, supply the construction, supply the staffing. And so there's a lot of money to be made on incarceration. And this is something that the 13th documentary addresses. So there's just a whole bunch of money to be made. The more people you lock up, the more money that you'll make. Uh, also tied to this, and this is something we're talking about a lot, in Portland in the 1980s was uh, defunding of mental health uh, facilities, resources for people who are experiencing mental health crisis. And so in the 1980s, and this has continued into the 21st century, we just ship those people right to prison uh, because um, we don't have hospital beds or we don't have outpatient facilities so we just warehouse the mental ill which of course has changed what it's like to be in prison you're warehoused with a population that has high rates of mental illness there's also the political appeal and this is for fortunately changed and you got to give trump some credit for uh caring about things like prison reform but in the 80s and the 90s where you were a republican or a democrat whether you're ronald reagan or bill clinton the way to get elected was to talk about locking up the bad guys you, you, nobody was going to be soft on crime um so the way to get elected was to talk about how you're going to lock everyone up and so republicans and democrats alike both got really tough on this and then of course a factor in this you have to say when we talk about the new jim crow is institutional racism we're still dealing with the racism from the 19th century into the 20th century. Uh, and if you can stereotype minorities, especially black males, as criminal threats, when they're doing the exact same thing that white people are doing, um, you can get a lot of support for locking them up because it reinforces the narrative that, that black male equals threat. And it just is an extension of the Jim Crow laws of the first half of the 20th century become the mass incarceration of the second half of the 20th century into the 21st century.
I wanted to talk a little bit about how this also impacted not only women, I mean, there's really an increase in the incarceration of women, but also an increase in the incarceration of juveniles. Um, we start our first juvenile court in 1899 in Chicago under the idea that juveniles can be saved, that we can treat them, we can help them and prevent them from becoming adult criminals. So we set up a juvenile court. There's a criminal court for the adults and a juvenile court for people under the age of 18. And this is the idea that we can treat juveniles uh, and find uh, diversion programs for them. So there's more opportunities, more options. If I'm a juvenile judge, I'm kind of at the center of a hub. I'm in a wheel. And I could send a kid to lock up, but I could also send a kid to a group home. I could send a kid into a job training program. I could send a kid into counseling. I could send a kid into an education program. I've got more resources, including therapy and and medical assistance. I mean, there are all kinds of things that I can do. So that's the idea of the juvenile court is that um, juvenile lockup is sort of the last um, the last resort. Um, but I can also send that kid to an adult prison. In Oregon, we have a thing called Measure 11, which allowed anybody 15 or older who commits a felony offense to be tried as an adult. Uh, and that means, um, it's called a waiver. We waive those kids uh, into the adult prison. So you can get teen, and we've had this in Oregon, you can get a 16 year old sent to adult prisons. And you can imagine it's not very good for them. Um, at the peak of the crime wave in 1994, 91% of juveniles, 91% of juveniles who were sent to a correctional facility were waived to an adult prison. That's insane if you think about it. And it highlights something that we call the school to prison pipeline. And this is something that really, when we're talking about things like um, institutional racism, it's really important. So what's the, what is the school to prison pipeline? The school to prison pipeline is how easy it is to be in school one day and be in prison the next day. Uh, and a lot of this comes out of the get tough on crime idea about just clamping down on everybody, including kids who are delinquent in school. And, and let me tell you, there's a lot of delinquents in school. A lot of us did things that we shouldn't do, whether it's drugs or sassing our teacher or stealing stuff or getting in fights. I mean, I mean, you grew up in the South and fighting in high school is normal. You know, the last thing you, I would want to hear in school is, Blaze Act. Let's go out and solve this like men. And I'm like, oh shit, we're gonna fight. You know, fight, fight, fight. I was just, you know, so there's a lot of bad behavior in school, especially when you have public schools that have huge populations. You have kids coming from maybe traumatized backgrounds from families where they're experiencing violence at home or experiencing poverty or experiencing God knows what. I mean, schools, surprise, surprise, are a front line for manifesting a lot of that bad behavior. So uh, starting in this clampdown in the 80s, it started getting a lot easier uh, to be in school one day and all of a sudden be in the criminal justice system the next. And there's a couple elements that tie to this. One is the rise of zero tolerance discipline, where number, you know the school is going to take any action uh, lightly. <coughs> Excuse me, not going to get a warning. You get caught in school with drugs, that's it. You get in a fight, that's it. You steal something, that's it. Um, and so the zero tolerance immediately moved kids. Instead of sen sending them to detention, you know, like the breakfast club, uh, sent them into the criminal justice system, uh, reported them to the police. The police would come and take the kid out of the classroom. This hap this still happens to this day. Uh, the, the rise of disciplinary alternative schools. The state started spending as one of its kind of ways of dealing with juvenile delinquents, these alternative schools that were where the bad kids went. And of course, the bad kids just reinforce their bad behavior and their labeling. And it doesn't stop them from being bad. It puts them on a path right to the criminal justice system. And the goal of the prison, the school to prison pipeline is to funnel out the bad kids. Because there's this notion that the bad kids contaminate the good kids. And the best way to keep the good kids good, this is differential association theory, if you'll remember, the best way to keep the good kids good is to remove the, the toxic influence of the bad kids. So what are you going to do with those bad kids that you're removing? You're going to put them in a better school? You're going to get them some therapy? You're going to get them some um, school lunch so they can, you know, have a healthy diet and maybe calm down a little bit? Maybe they've got a food allergy that's been undiagnosed? No, you're just going to warehouse them in juvie. Uh, and so we see this with the rise of police officers in school. You know, they have a safety officer in school. Um, it increases the rate of the number of kids in that school who get locked up. 
And what we saw, what we've seen with this is a, a disproportionate impact on children of color, that kids who are brown or black are much more likely to um, um, be shipped into the funnel, into the school to prison pipeline. Uh, over 50% of the students involved in school related arrests or referred to law enforcement are children of color, black and brown kids. And so the school to prison pipeline is basically said, if you're black and you go to school uh, and you get in trouble at school, you're going into the criminal justice system. White kids, yeah, you know, they come from a good home. We'll give them another chance. Maybe give them a little attention. Have to write their name 300 times. Black kid, cops are coming to pick you up. You can tell your mom that you'll be down at the jail. And so this has been another uh, way that the system has reinforced um, reinforced racism. So what we're going to talk about at the end of this is what happens to people when they come out. How do we provide resources for people who've been through a very um, traumatizing experience, either as juveniles or as adults in prisons. Uh, so that's just a little picture, a little snapshot of the problem of prison, the explosion of the prison rate, the role that race plays. Uh, and then we're going to talk about coming out of prison in the next lecture. So there's a discussion question coming up. All right, that's it.